ask yourself this question, why did the church never and will never approve the Gospel of Enoch, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Because they take truths that were preached at the time of Christ, these were listeners to some of those who heard from the apostles, and they mix it with witchcraft, or they mix it with esotericism, or they mix it with fables, or they mix it with their own self-project the thoughts, thinking it's from God and it's not, or from the devil that's deceiving them. And they bundle it all together and they put it on the website. And 99% of the time, guess who these people are that create these blogs and end time websites? They are lay men. 99% they're lay Catholic men that have no theological credentials, number one. This is 99% that have no backing from their bishops, that were never schooled in Catholic theology with any degree, were noteworthy. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, let me start the video by saying thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos and hopefully you'll learn something useful for your own spiritual warfare. And so anyway, for this video, it's going to be something quite interesting to share with all of you. Well, we've seen it a lot, even here on YouTube. As Dr. James of the Divine Will Channel put forward his question to Father Joseph Iannuzzi, and I quote, You know there are many people claiming to be seers and visionaries, and many of them have been debunked and exposed for being mistaken or troubled individuals. However, there are a handful of people claiming to be Catholic seers or mystics who have attracted large followings and have achieved internet fame as their sensational claims of dire messages continue to capture the imaginations of many. Contrary to their supporters, the debunked claims of celebrity seers has fueled a reactionary movement that attacks prophetic tradition of the church and has hindered legitimate prophetic revelation from explicating the deposit of faith and supporting the faithful in these turbulent times. And so basically what I'd like to share with all of you in this video is to share the highlights of what Father Joseph Iannuzzi commented on the false predictions of contemporary celebrity seers because it seems like no matter how demonstrably false their claims are, the enthusiasm to believe the next exciting prediction doesn't seem to dwindle their fame. And a sort of sordid excitement is at foot for this type of trendy Catholic fortune telling. These false promoters give, give the reader a sales pitch. And again, I'm not judging their intentions. Some of them may have, may have started out with good intentions. Some of them may not have. Some of them may have been corrupted along the way. But the result is always the same. They give you a, a sales pitch of this never ending saga of the latest and sadist false message. There's going to be a third world war. The third world war has begun. Another pandemic is gonna follow shortly. It's the end of the economy. We're moving from the paper to the digital. There's gonna be mass extermination, global disasters. The church has entered the tomb. The Pope's gonna die. Now, I'm not condemning these. Some of them may be true, but it's the accumulative, immediate, daily badgering of this that disconnects the intellect from the memory. And this provides an opportunity for opportunist promoters of false messages, apocalyptic messages, to make a killing. Now the laity are dismayed by the diabolical confusion of our, which Our Lady spoke of at Fatima, coupled with their lack of fortitude, as well as the lack of masculinity leadership among the church's prelates. Not all, but several. And therefore the laity go in search of sound and fearless preachers of the truth, like the Fulton J. Sheens in the 60s, who was my mentor. I looked up to him in everything, and I still do. The man was timeless. His message will never be lost. That promote the unchanging doctrines of Christ, forged by sacred scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching. It is within this context that I wish to approach this, this context of confusion within the state, within the church. Our Lady alluded to this as well at Akita, Japan, when she said that there will be cardinal opposing cardinal, bishop opposing bishop. Priests devoted to me will be shunned by their own brothers in the ministry, their own conquerors, and that's happening today. So in response to this desperate need of the laity to go find leaders mm. of a masculine fiber in their sermons, in their 
proclamation of the truth, not provoking, but just speaking the truth in love without candy coating it and not finding these leaders in many areas. They're out there, but not everywhere. Start to create their own incentives like blogs, websites to, I hate to say this, I'm sure some of them are well-intentioned, I'm sure, but others are less well-intentioned. Some will use this as an opportunity on which to make a killing monetarily. And they avail themselves of the vulnerability and the naivete of the faithful who are looking for this spirit of leadership. Now, enter the opportunists, AKA false promoters of false apocalyptic messages. There's nothing wrong with the word apocalyptic provided you preach the truth. But unfortunately in this word, there's a lot to be desired because a lot of people will use the scripture and interpret it in the way they think. First of all, what does all this do? All this promotion of fear, fright, it disposes the readers, the blog followers, the website readers, to depend upon them and not the church, nor its ministers to obtain protection, the truth, salvation. Sadly, the followers will have a rude awakening, as has always been the case in the past, when these promises fail. In this case, the overriding sense of fear from this gloom and doom message of helplessness and imminency generated by these false promoters so overwhelmingly impacts the memory that the intellect does not process this information with reflection, with counsel, with prayer. It doesn't go to the memory and try to assess by going to the storage of knowledge whether or not this is objectively true. It acts without even consulting oftentimes with the memory. Why? Number one, because the bloggers are constantly churning out the latest and sadist fear-mongering news. And they're trying to process it every day. They're reading every morning they wake up this stuff. There are many of these websites out there with it. And all of them, all of them have zero approval of the church. And so then we should also be wondering how then for those who are serious about spiritual growth and desire to properly engage with the prophetic component of our faith, how are we to remain loyal to Jesus' saving truth when we have these trendy movements that constitute failed predictions and that distract us from the true Catholic prophets? There are two approaches in the church that are not solitary, and there is one that is. You have in all Christian circles those who lag behind the church, which are often referred to as ultra conservatives. And these tend to take matters in their own hands. Rather than look to the church, they tend to look to people they handpick and trust in. Then you have ultra liberals who anticipate the church's changes before the church makes them. And these people do the same. They follow handpicked individuals, not the church. And then the third source, which is the solitary one or pathway that leads to righteousness and the kingdom is walking side by side with the church, being loyal to the church's magisterium, which incorporates sacred scripture, tradition. It's not lagging behind it, rejecting Vatican II. It's not running ahead of it, anticipating Vatican III. It's walking side by side with the church. And when a person adopts that approach, what you mention begins to dissipate on, on its own. That is, uh, people seeking to follow the most recent messages unapproved by the church that are not yet therefore authenticated in this quagmire of falsehoods and truths being thrown at you from all angles in the church, while at the same time trying to remain faithful to the magisterium. If you simply remain faithful to the magisterium, that's a good start. Number two, what about these messages that are coming down the pike? Should we ignore all, the, all of them? No. Then how are we to process them and discern the veracity thereof or lack thereof? Not by going to these blogs and websites that just exacerbate your discernment process, will leave you more exhausted than when you tuned into them and more confused. 
but go to those individuals that are sanctioned by their bishops, by their superiors, by the church, that are qualified in this field. When I say qualified, I don't mean they say so. Mm -hmm. The Vatican backs them through degrees of learning. This is what the whole issue of degrees is about. You cannot get a doctoral degree without going through a battery of tests. There was a bishop from Turkey who was from Padua. Uh, He was the dean of the Pontifical University of the Antonianum, a patristic theology in Rome. He was my professor many, many moons ago, uh, back in the 1990s. And he said this, and it's true, it is easier to become a bishop than it is to become a professor. (laughs) Because to get to that level of doctrine, sacred theology at the pontifical level, you really have to, well, you have to know several languages, number one, English doesn't cut it. And then you have to be able to theologize and extract the inner meaning of various texts in the original language, whether it's Koine Greek, Hebrew, Old Testament, um, Latin, the Vulgate, your own native language, etc. And even referring to biblical sources from Germany, who did that did a lot of scriptural studies. And then, of course, if you've made it that far, then you have to get past the final exam, which is a battery of investigations on the on the part of professors that drill you in different field branches of theology. So my point is, go to a qualified person that has this knowledge that can guide you properly and don't go to those people that tell you what to do well, there are too many of them go to people who counsel you on what to do god never forces the free human will he guides it he gently guides it by giving you principles upon which you base your own decisions that's how god is he never tells you what to do very rarely does god command and those commandments are mostly limited to expelling bad, like get behind me, Satan. For those of you who are interested to listen to the full live stream of Father Yanuzi talking about this very subject, I left the link to the video down in the description box below. And I would also like to add one popular end times belief is that Jesus will establish a throne on the earth and reign for a literal thousand years. This is a heretical interpretation of Revelation 20 called millenarianism and is condemned by the church. The 1,000 years in Revelation is a biblical literary device common to apocalyptic writings that denotes an indefinite long time between the persecutions of the church of the first century and the final unleashing of evil at the end. So Jesus reigns now, both in eternity and in and through the church. Neither will there be a rapture, a heretical interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 to 17, Luke 17 verse 34 to 37, and others, through which Jesus will rapture or remove Christians from the earth so that they escape the last persecution and purification of the church. This interpretation is entirely inconsistent with how God has always dealt with his people during persecutions throughout history, inconsistent with the purification purposes of persecutions, and inconsistent with Jesus' own persecution in Jesus himself, whom the church follows in all things, even death. Well, that's all for this video. I hope you've learned a lot about the danger of false doomsday prophets and seers that are going rampant these days. In fact, you see these kind of videos a lot on YouTube. And with that, the never-ending sense of gloom and doom. For those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation down in the description box below. Any amount of contribution is very much appreciated, and thank you so much in advance to all of you. Well, until the next video, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. I've also heard people say, read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will inspire you how to interpret it. Well, good luck with that. Just look how many sects we have in the Christian church. Thousands, thousands of sects we have, denominations, all interpreting the Bible differently. Why? Because everyone adopted that approach just about. Whereas unless you consult with someone who has been trained in the analogy of faith, that is in the entire corpus of the given revelation, in order to apply each individual sentence to its entire corpus, then you're not going to properly understand what that means. You're going to make a mistake. And so what am I saying? You have to be humble whenever you want to seek the truth. And this is what is lacking among these bloggers. There's this lack of humility. If, they were, if it was present, they wouldn't be on their own navigating through this a minefield of heresies and schisms that have occurred over the past 2,000 years. As you explore 
what is proverbially called the rabbit's hole and you go deeper into it, the more you begin to question everything. Now, you have to have, when you go there, an unshakable foundation. Otherwise, it's better not to go at all. Because when I was writing my uh, dissertation, I put out beforehand a book called The Splendor of Creation. And in it, it talked about those who wanted to explore the end times and the things that accompany the end times. And I'm going to quote to you from one of the Hebrew writers who went crazy, I'm not exaggerating, by devoting full time to all these events in the book of Revelation and the unfolding of the details articulated in the books of Daniel and Ezekiel and, the, and other books that refer to the future, including Zephaniah. There was a work by the Hebrews. Man was studying them at length, studying the Misha, the Chachicha, and this was stated of the scholar who was studying. Better for him who meditates on these things not to have been born. What is above, what is below, what is before, what is behind. And the Talmudic commentary speaks of several masters in Israel who in attempting to resolve prophetic mysteries suffered dire consequences. For example, Ben Aza died. Ben Zoma went crazy. Elisha Ben Ayuba became an apostate. So to occupy oneself with eschatology, the end time events, because of the negative and dire and cataclysmic implications can indeed be unsettling and even traumatic. So to avoid this pitfall, what does one do? They have to survey the eschatological landscape from a biblio-historical perspective, not just from what the seer says. The seer doesn't provide that. Using the church's traditional modus operandi, which is the modus operandi, is a method of study that penetrates the traditional teachings and presents them by looking at the past and presenting them to our modern era as an inspired development, homogenous development of the teachings of Christ. Now, why the teachings of Christ? Because they are always hope-filled. When you do not present them in the optic of Christ, they are full of despair. 